Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Recent Changes to Ensure Compliance. My name is Charlotte, and I will be hosting today's webinar. Today's session will run for approximately 45 minutes with 15 minutes of questions. Questions can be submitted at any time in the question box on the webinar's control panel. In this webinar, you will hear about what every business must have in place to ensure they are compliant with the Fair Work Act and National Employment Standards in Australia. Our presenter today is Cheryl Disher, who is the founder and director of HR Advice Online. Cheryl has 25 years experience in human resources and industrial relations in major Australian and international corporate and employer associations. Cheryl's experience covers the automotive automotive industry, food manufacturing, building and construction, and many others as the regional manager of an employer association in Queensland. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to hand you over to Cheryl. Thanks, Charlotte, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for being on the, on the webinar today. I just wanted to point out before we launch into some content that this webinar is general advice only. If you would like more specific advice about any of the issues that you might have directly for yourself or your clients, please feel free to send us an email at the end of the webinar and we will get someone to call you and have a conversation about how we can help. Um, the complexity of some of the issues that we get on these webinars, we do need to ask lots of questions to drill down into the specific issues so as we can actually help you. So I hope you appreciate that the advice that we're giving today is just general advice. I'm not sure what's happening there, Charlotte. I don't seem to be able to... Um, move my screen. Oh, here we go. So I'm the one on the red, in the red on the right hand side of the screen, ladies and gents. Um, as I said, thanks for being here today. My name's Cheryl Disher and thanks very much for the introduction, Charlotte. Now I'm hoping that that's going to work. Here we go. So what we're going to go through today um, is HR compliance, what every business needs to know. To start with, there are a number of things that you need to have in place as an employer or as a bookkeeper or accountant assisting employers. You need to ensure that your clients have the right documentation in the event that there is an audit undertaken by Fair Work Australia. The Fair Work Ombudsman's Office has the authority to walk into your office in the same way that a WorkSafe inspector can and do payroll record and compliance checks around employee files and payroll records. So I just want you to keep that in mind and that is some of the context of the reason of why we provide this information. Two things that you need up front in terms of documentation, you need to have a letter of offer. That letter of offer often called a contract of employment. A contract of employment is purely a letter of offer stating the terms and conditions of employment. One of the things that it must have in it is a reference to the applicable award. Now, we often hear that my employees are paid salary, therefore they're not covered by an award. That's a myth and we will go into that in a further webinar later on in the year. The other thing that you also need to have in place is evidence that all employees have been provided with a copy of the Fair Work Information Statement. The Fair Work Information Statement is available through the Fair Work Ombudsman's website. It's also available through HR Advice Online. Um, the National Employment Standards. There are 10 National Employment Standards and we will go into those in more detail in a later slide. Award coverage, as I said before, um, employees, even if they're covered by a salary, are often covered by an award. However, accountants are award free, and but bookkeepers and admin staff and financial planning staff in an accounting practice are covered by an award. So in the event that you're operating in an accounting practice or a bookkeeping practice, you are covered by an award and you do need to have a copy of that award available in your office for employees to be able to access and the Act actually says without fear or favour. So they need to, it needs to be in a space where they can go and get a copy of it without anyone noticing them or without there being any fear that their employee, employer might say, what do you need that for? Um, so award coverage is, is um, 
it doesn't matter how much you are paid, even if you paid $100,000, you may still be covered by an award and that's just that you are paid over and above the award. Um, a probationary period needs to be in your letter of offer and depending upon the size of your business in terms of the amount of employees that you have will depend upon the probationary period. The probationary period under the Fair Work Act is now called a trial period, however most contracts of employment and letters of offer still refer to it as a probationary period. For a business that has less than 15 employees, so that's 14 or less, um, the probationary period is 12 months. In the event that you have more than 15 employees, including 15, then the probationary period is 12 months. The small business definition, uh, sorry, the small business exemptions, um, again, it's a bit of a myth that small businesses aren't covered by the Fair Work Act. They are, and the same applies to a small business as applies to a large business in the event that you have employees, whether it's one employee or whether it's two and a half thousand employee. However, there are a couple of small business exemptions and they are that in the event that you have 14 and less employees and you are making people redundant, there is no need to pay a redundancy payment. However, the notice period under the Fair Work Act still applies and you can choose to pay that notice period in lieu and the notice period is very dependent upon the years of service that the employee has with the employer. And in the event that you have more than 15 employers, so you are deemed to be a large business, then you must pay the redundancy payments that are provided in the National Employment Standards and under the Fair Work Act. The other exemption is that um, under the unfair dismissal provisions, there is an inability for an employee to claim an unfair dismissal in the event that they have had less than 12 months employment. However, adverse action claims and protections disputes are still available for employees if they have had less than 12 months service with a small employer. So they are the only two exemptions that apply for small to medium businesses in Australia under the Fair Work Act. There's a key message in all of this and that is in the event that you have an unfair dismissal, um, one of the things that we would always advise is settle early, conciliate early because if you don't it will cost money. We've seen unfortunately a, a, a number of businesses stand on principle and say well I'm going to fight this because the employee is wrong. That may be the case but the employee will get some money and in the event that you don't settle early it will end up costing the employer more than what it actually needs to. By way of example for that um, in the last quarter of 2015, there were 3,636 applications made for unfair dismissal. Of those, 2,964 were settled at conciliation or prior to conciliation without them actually going on to, on to arbitration. Of that 3,636, and this is a statistic that I'd actually love you to remember, there were 427 applications made against small employers, so employers that had 14 or less employees. Of that 427, only four were dismissed because the dismissal was consistent with the Small Business Fair Dismissal Code. Now that doesn't mean that the employer had more, the employee had more than 12 months service. The commission has the power at its sole right to determine whether there has been fairness or unfairness in the um, dismissal process and therefore allowing the employee, even though they may have had less than 12 months service, to lodge an unfair dismissal claim. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Our message is always, if you get an unfair dismissal claim, settle it early because otherwise it's going to cost you more than it needs to. The National Employment Standards are the 10 minimum standards that apply to 
employees working under the Fair Work Act in Australia. They are, there is a maximum weekly hours where employees can be paid 38 hours per week and that is 38 hours per week. We had one of our clients sent through a letter of offer to us for us to review yesterday and they had that the ordinary hours of work will be 43. Now that's not allowable under the National Employment Standards. How they could have written that was the ordinary hours are 38 plus there will be regularly rostered an additional five hours per week which have been included in your salary and calculated under the better off overall test so as the employee is not worse off. But the maximum weekly hours applicable to employees working under the Fair Work Act in Australia is 38. Um, employees can request flexible working arrangements and they can request those on the basis of carers requirements and that's caring for parents, aged parents or children um, and or for people who may be um, disabled or sick in their household. So employees have the right to request flexible working, hour, working arrangements. All employees have the right to parental leave and related entitlements. All employees other than casuals have the right to annual leave accrual. And as we know, the annual leave accrual in Australia for full-time employees is, tw is 20 days, four weeks. And in the event that someone is part-time, then it's calculated on a pro rata basis. All employees other than casuals have the right to personal carers leave and compassionate leave. One of the questions that we often get when we do these webinars is, does personal carers leave include, include sick leave? Personal carers leave is sick leave and it was renamed under the Fair Work Act when the Fair Work Act came into play in 2009. So sick leave equals personal carer's leave. Compassionate leave is the old bereavement leave um, and has been extended to include caring for someone who is terminally ill before they die. Um, all employees other than casuals are entitled to community service leave and community service leave is generally speaking, but depending upon the award, leave without pay um, or leave where an employee can access their annual leave to attend if they are a volunteer, things like SES and fire um, and, and potentially flood issues. So community service leave um, is available to all employees other than casual employees. Long service leave. Long service leave is available to all employees and depending upon which state you are, you are in depends upon the accrual level because this is one of the um, residuals that are still around that are still state based, everything else is federal. So the long service leave acts are still state based and do vary from state to state. Casuals are entitled to long service leave. So in the event that a casual has been working for an employer for the entitled period under the Long Service Leave Act of the state that they're working in, a casual is entitled to long service leave. All employees are t entitled to public holidays and for casuals um, they are entitled to the public holiday in the event that they work it, there is um, a public holiday penalty that applies to casuals working on a public holiday. All other employees are entitled to public holidays without the loss of pay. All employees are entitled to notice of termination and for those employees who are under, who are employed by employers who have more than 15 employees, they are also entitled to redundancy pay. And all employees are entitled to receive a copy of the Fair Work Information Statement and you as an employer must have on their file evidence that they have been provided with that Fair Work Information Statement. Pay slip obligations. This is a very, very busy slide and I hope you guys can read this. Um, under the Fair Work Act there is a requirement for employers to provide 
all employees with a pay slip. There are some fines that are payable in the event that the Fair Work Ombudsman either does an audit or an employee complains to the Fair Work Ombudsman that they have not been provided with a pay slip. The fines are $510 for an individual per contravention and $2,550 for a company in the event that there is a contravention of this particular section of the Fair Work Act. If, a, um, if an employer fails to meet their obligations under the Fair Work Act, to provide pay slips to, to employees and that is deemed by the Fair Work Ombudsman's inspectors that it's serial, se sorry, serious, willful or repetitive, the Fair Work Inspector may recommend that the matter be taken to court. If the matter is taken to court then the penalties are, are and can be more severe. So just to roll through things that, may, that must be included on the pay slip um, by the employer, the employer's name, the employer's ABN. Now on the slide it says if any, um, one would assume that an employer does have an ABN and that they're registered for GST. The employee's name must be on the payslip, the date of payment and the period of the payment, the gross amount of the payment and the net amount of the payment. Any loadings, as in casuals, casual get, um, gets 25% loading, so that must be separated out and identified other than the base hourly rate. Um, monetary allowances, i.e. travel allowance, bonuses if there's commission or incentive based payments, penalty rates or other separately identifiable entitlements that are paid. And that might be travel money, it might be tea money, it might be, um, it wouldn't be a reimbursement of expenses. So if an employee brings in a receipt, for example, and you're reimbursing them, that doesn't have to be included on the pay slip. But anything that is taxable or travel allowances that are not taxable need to be identified very clearly and separately on the pay slip. If the employee is paid an hourly pay, pay rate, the ordinary hourly pay rate and the number of hours that are worked at that rate and therefore the applicable total amount must be identified at, on the pay slip. If the employee is paid an annual rate of pay, i.e. a salary, the rate as at the last day in the pay period must be included on the pay slip. Any deductions made? And just a, a little note here, deductions must be with the authority of the employee. So in the event that it is other than superannuation, um, you need to have written documentation and approval on the employee's file that they have authorised that deduction. So any, any deductions made including the name, the name and number of the, or the fund or the account of each deduction. Some employers um, do health fund deductions for example. So you need to have the evidence on the file that that is what the employee has authorised and then you need to identify what the amount is and where the money is going. If the employer is required to make superannuation contributions for the employee, you must have on the payslip the amount of the contribution the employer is making or is liable to make during that pay period, the name or the name and number of any superannuation fund into which the contributions are going to be made. So those things must be identified on the payslip. Charlotte, is it, is it time to take a little break and if, are there any questions that have come through that we can deal with um, at this point? Hi Cheryl, um, there have been a few questions that have come through. Um, one regarding jury duty. Uh, mm -hmm. If an employee is called for jury duty, I understand that they are entitled to make up pay for these days that they are summoned to court. However, can you request that they take unpaid community service leave or request that they take annual leave for the other days when they are not summoned to court? So as I understand the question, Charlotte, I'm just going to repeat it so as I've got it clear. The question is they're entitled to make up pay, which is absolutely correct. So the court will pay them for attending jury duty, but the employer has an obligation to make up their normal pay. 
Um, the way a lot of employers do that is that they pay the employee their normal pay and then the employee hands over the money that they get from the justice system to the employer um, so as they're not fiddling around with the employer's, employer's standard rate of pay for the time that they're on jury duty. I think the second part of your question was can they be asked to take annual leave or community service leave for the days that they're not required to attend court as a jury member. Was that the question? Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely, because they are only entitled to the days that they are required to attend for jury duty. So anything outside of, of the requirement to attend jury duty would be annual leave, it wouldn't be community service leave. Okay, that's great. Um, another question that has come through, Cheryl, is um, is personal carer's leave accumulated from year to year? If so, is it law or can an employer make it set each year, i.e. not rollover of unused leave? It is law that personal carer's leave, i.e. sick leave, rolls over from year to year and the employer can't change that. You can't pay it out and you must accumulate it from year to year. The amount of days that it is current is 10 days per year per, per employee. Okay, um, another question. Uh, you mentioned 12 months probation for both over 15 employees and under 15 employees. Please clarify if this is the new standard. Okay, so it's 12 months probation for less than 15 employees. It is six months probation maximum for more than 15 employees. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. Um, okay. what, what is the trial period for employees in a small business less than 14 employees? That would be... 12 months. Yeah. yeah 12 months. Um, bereavement leave. Is this part of 10 days for compassionate leave or is this additional time to be given as paid time? Okay, compassionate leave is bereave, bereavement leave and it's not 10 days per year, it's two days per occasion. So let's hope this never happens but if an employee lost a mother, father, a brother, sister during the one year then it's two days per occasion so that would be eight days overall. That doesn't come out of their 10 days of personal carer's leave. That is purely compassionate leave and it is separate to the accrual. That doesn't accrue and it doesn't roll over, but personal carer's leave of 10 days per year does. Okay. Um, what if a contract has already been provided that doesn't have a reference to the governing award? Does a new contract need to be issued or can a letter be provided advising the employee of this information? That's a great question and we would always advise and, and this is general advice so whoever asked that question happy to happy for you to send us more detail on this question later on after the webinar. Um, that depends on the length of service of the employee and we would always advise that every couple of years you need to refresh and confirm employees terms and conditions of employment. We often see that you know someone's been employed for 10 years or 20 years or 25 years, they've got a, a one pager um, that has the original terms and conditions in it but nothing's ever been updated on the employee's files so there isn't, a la there isn't clear understanding by the employee when things changed. So we would always advise that when, when something changes that you refresh the employee's contract of employment by providing them with a confirmation of employment letter that says here are the terms and conditions that have changed and here and everything else stays the same. Okay, um, there are a few more questions coming through. Did you want me to continue? Um, we might do a couple more, Charlotte, and then we'll roll into the next part of the, um, the presentation. Okay. 
Okay. Um, what are the employer's obligations regarding the date of payment of pay? How is this affected if the normal pay date falls on a weekend or a public holiday, for example? The normal pay day should never fall on a weekend because normally pay day would be between the days of Monday to Friday. If a pay day falls on a public holiday, we would advise that it's within 24 hours of that public holiday ceasing, so the next day the payment ne pay payroll needs to be made and that's the requirement under the Fair Work Act. Best practice, however, is that it is always done the, the working day prior to the public holiday. So if a payday falls on a Monday, it would normally, pays would normally be processed on the Friday before. Okay, great. Um, another question is, I divided the annual salary by 52 weeks and then by 38 hours to get an hourly rate. Is that okay? Yes, that is okay. And then you need to ensure that that hourly rate is um, covered by the minimum rate of pay under the award that is applicable. Okay. Um, I was under the impression that you can pay out personal carer's leave as long as you hold a bank of 114 hours. Um, that's not correct. Okay. You can, you can, if you are covered by an enterprise agreement, have a negotiation around personal carer's leave. Um, but under the Fair Work Act, there is no capability to pay out personal carer's leave. Personal carer's leave doesn't get paid out on termination of employment. Um, so if the employee leaves the employer, and they haven't used their personal carer's leave, then that balance is wiped and goes back um, into the employer's general um, bank. Um, annual leave, you can, at the request of the employee, pay out a portion of annual leave as long as they retain um, four weeks of annual leave in their bank. Okay. Um, Last one. Yeah, we work in the building and construction industry in Queensland working under EBA and mm -hmm. are there circumstances that the lines could be blurred as to legislation and requirements and if so, which takes precedence? Great question and to whomever asked that question, happy to have a conversation with you offline. Um, because that will be a very specific question. It depends on what you're talking about, but the general rule is whichever is the greater. So in the event that the Fair Work Act or the award provides a greater provision than the enterprise agreement, that would take pre precedence. But in the event that the enterprise agreement provides a greater provision to the employees, then that would take precedence. Having said that, if something has been negotiated through the enterprise agreement bargaining process where the employees have given away something that is covered by the Fair Work Act as a minimum condition then and that's in the enterprise agreement, then the enterprise agreement would take precedence. So as you can see by the complexity of my answer on that one, um, that would depend on the specific enterprise agreement. So to who, whomever asked that question, happy to have a conversation with you offline. Okay, thanks for those. Um, we might move on now, Charlotte, if that's okay. Yep, that's fine, thanks. Great, so from 2009 to the end of 2014, there was a review undertaken of the Modern Awards. And when the Modern Awards, so when we went from a state-based system in 2008-2009 to a federal system, the Industrial Relations Commission and the Fair Work Ombudsman at the time committed to reviewing the awards over the first four years to ensure that they were working with the intent upon which they were developed. Um, there's been a number of reviews and those reviews are ongoing at the moment um, and I'm just going to, going to, to go to my notes here. There's been 
since about September last year and ongoing now through until the end of the end of this year, there are submissions being made by the employer associations, the unions and um, major industry bodies and also major organisations around how these awards are, are working. And a couple of things that are changing. Um, changes relate to the capacity to cash out annual leave, excessive annual leave and the taking of leave in advance. Um, those are being looked at through the four yearly modern award review as is annual leave loading. Um, at the moment, all employees are entitled to annual leave loading of 17.5% unless their contract of employment, their enterprise agreement or their letter of offer specifically states that it is included in their rate of pay. And to the person who asked the question about, I've taken the annual salary, divided it by 52 and then divided it by 38, if that meets the minimum award requirement of the rate of pay in the minimum in the award that is applicable, then you must add the 17.5% annual leave loading to that as well. A lot of employers get caught out that they say, we're going to pay this person $60,000 a year, that's above the minimum award requirement. But what they don't do is then state in the contract of employment or their letter of offer that annual leave loading is included within that $60,000. In the event that they don't say that, then the employee has an entitlement to annual leave loading. Annual leave loading can either be paid at the time of taking annual leave or it can be paid as a, a lot of employers pay it as a pre-Christmas bonus. So they pay it in the, in the pay prior to Christmas um, and annual leave loading is paid on termination of employment for leave that hasn't been used in some awards. Not all awards, but in some awards. So depending upon the award that is applicable to the work that you are doing, you actually need to check that. Um, <clears throat> last year there were a number of changes made to the bullying provisions um, that first came into place in 2010 and part of those um, changes was that claims of bullying can now be made directly to the Fair Work Commission. You don't have to notify your employer, you can go directly to the Fair Work Ombudsman, make a complaint that your employer or someone within your employer's business is bullying you. In the last quarter of 2015, there were 175 applications made to the Fair Work Commission. Um, for bullying issues being undertaken within organisations. Twelve of those were finalised by a decision which means that all others were either withdrawn or were, were resolved prior, the, prior to them actually um, going to a full hearing. Now that may mean that there was um, an investigation or a um, conciliation undertaken by the Fair Work Commission and there was resolution at that time. There were a number of applications that were dismissed and there were a number of applications where there was an, um, there was an application granted because the employee was deemed to be at risk by the employer and there was an order issued. So I won't go into the spe specific numbers but there were, there were a number of those but as I said, um, a large number of them were withdrawn and there were only 12 orders made um, and, final, and finalised by a decision. General changes under the model of modern awards and I'll just take you through a bit of a timeline here. As I said there were 12, um, sorry, the awards, the awards are currently being reviewed. There was a number of submissions submitted to the Fair Work Ombudsman and the Fair Work Commission and submissions closed on the 12th of November 2015. On the 14th of December they looked at any other additional substantive issues that may come up. Then they opened up to interested parties to file written submissions on any drafting issues under the awards and they had to be submitted by the 10th of March 2016. 
by the 7th of April, replies to those submissions had to be um, in place and received by the Fair Work Ombudsman's Office. And then there will be a full hearing um, with the full bench of the Fair Work Commission um, on the 2nd and 3rd of May. Now there's a couple of things that the ACTU have um, put in as general claims to be adopted in all awards. So it's not industry specific, it's across all 122 modern awards. And they are domestic violence leave and the ACTU has put in a, a log of claims that 10 days domestic violence leave be granted to all employees under the that are covered by awards and that's 10 days of paid domestic violence leave and unlimited unpaid leave for those suffering from domestic violence and the right to request flexible working hours in the event that you are a sufferer of domestic violence. Um, the definition of domestic violence and the evidentiary requirements for an employee to provide to the employer um, that they are suffering from domestic violence have not yet been completely defined but they are very broad. The other one that the ACTU has put in as a general log of claim is for award flexibility um, that employees returning from the 12 months parental leave or maternity leave that they have the right to return to part-time work. Now some of you might say, well that's already available. What's available today under the, the current provisions of the Fair Work Act and the award is the right to request to return to part-time work. The employer has an obligation to assess whether or not the business can meet that request and in the event that the business can't undertake that flexibility, then the business has the right to say they can't accommodate flexible return to work and part-time return to work. Um, the difference with this is that the ACTU is requesting that the awards and the Fair Work Act be um, changed to unilaterally provide to employees returning from maternity leave or parental leave the right to return to part-time work. So as I said, um, <clears throat> the Fair Work Commission at the moment is, is looking at these provisions. Um, I just want to go into a little bit more detail around domestic violence leave, if that's okay. Um, for the purpose of, of the clause that's been submitted to the Fair Work Commission for them to review, family and domestic violence is defined as any violent, threatening or other behaviour by a person that coerces or controls a member of the person's family or household or causes the family to, or household member to be fearful. It includes current or former partners in an intimate relationship whenever and wherever the violence occurs. It may include physical, sexual, emotional, psychological or financial abuse. The employer then must take all reasonable measures to ensure personal information concerning an employer's experience of family and domestic violence is kept confidential. And the employer must provide, must appoint a family and domestic violence workplace contact person to provide a first point of contact for employees experiencing family and domestic violence. The employer must ensure that the contact person is trained in family and domestic violence issues and is able to provide employees with access to the relevant employee assistance program and or appropriate local specialist resources support and referral services. So that is part of the claim from the ACTU that's currently being considered by the Fair Work Commission and that will go to the full bench hearing on the 2nd and 3rd of May this year. The other one um, that I just wanted to raise is that employees can access a medical certificate from a chemist, they don't have to attend a doctor. So chemists have the authority to um, sign off a medical certificate for an employee. A lot of chemists charge for that but it's a charge of five or ten dollars. And the other provision as I said um, that is being considered by the full bench hearing on the 2nd and 3rd of May is award flexibility, return to work provisions for 
employees returning from parental and maternity leave and the others that are being considered are um, time in lieu being accrued in lieu of overtime and penalty rates in the hospitality industry and the part-time and casual work provisions under the award system. So what you need to do from here is ensure that your employment contracts or letters of offer are up to date. Um, it would be useful to review employee files and, and have a look at those and if they're not up to date to reissue as confirmation of employment letters. Review the, the provisions of part-time employees and their contracts. One of the things that where employers often get caught out is that in the event that an employee is part-time, they can work up to 38 hours of work at the ordinary rate of pay. But that needs to be specified in their letter of offer or contract of employment. In the event that it's not specified, then the employee has the right to claim overtime for hours that are in addition to their ordinary hours of work and their ordinary hours of work for a part-time employee um, must be specified. They must normally be on regular days and they must be specified to a maximum number of hours per week. Um, if you don't know what award applies to your business, give us a call. Um, because there is some sometimes confusion out there about which award applies. Um, there's a couple of awards apply to the, that apply to the building and, and joinery industry. There's a couple of awards that apply to the retail industry and the food and beverage industry. So in the event that you're not 100% certain about which awards apply to you, um, certainly feel free to, to send us an email. I want you all to check that you have specified and documented that annual leave loading is included if you are including it in a, in a salary. It needs to be documented in the event that it's not documented then the employee has the right to be paid annual leave loading at their general rate of pay. So if someone's paid $100,000 a year then they're entitled to four weeks of annual leave plus annual leave loading at the rate of $100,000 per year if that makes sense. So I just want you to check that. I'd also love you to check that you have measurable KPIs within your um, probationary period and ongoing for all employees. We often get questions from our clients, you know, this employee isn't performing, um, can I just get rid of them? You certainly can within a probationary period but once you pass the probationary period you need to have something to be able to measure the employee's performance against. The employer saying this employer isn't performing is far too subjective to actually win a, an unfair dismissal claim. So you need to, to ensure that you have specific KPIs that the employees must reach, codes of conduct in your business around employees' behaviour and policies and um, procedures that the employees must be implementing. So you performance manage against those rather than the employee being uncertain about what the standard is. I'd love you to check that you've got the, the appropriate policies and an employee handbook in place. And in this day and age with social media playing such a role in employees' lives, I need you to make sure that you've got a social media policy that all employees are aware of um, that is applicable for your business. Uh, there are more and more cases going through the Fair Work Commission around employees being terminated for inappropriate use on social media and where the employer doesn't have a social media policy that says what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, um, the Commission will always err in, fa in favour of the employee. And re-bullying, um, in the event that the, as employers um, or as service providers to employees, I'd love you to check whether there's been bullying training undertaken for employees and managers in the last 18 months. There is a requirement under the um, Occupational or Workplace Health and Safety Act and Occupational Health and Safety Act, depending upon which states you're sitting in, for employees and managers to be trained in their responsibilities and obligations um, for bullying and harassment. 
So I'd love you to go away and check that. Um, I just wanted to let you know that HR Advice Online in conjunction with Reckon are undertaking some, a breakfast series over the month of July. We're in Melbourne on Tuesday the 19th of July, in Sydney on Thursday the 21st of July and Brisbane on the 26th of July. Um, it's up on the Reckon website and if you're interested in, in registering and attending those breakfasts, both Kerry and I will be in attendance at those breakfasts and we'll be presenting at the breakfast some information that will be re very relevant for you and your business or for you and your clients. So Charlotte, have we got any more questions? Uh, yes, Charlotte, there's been quite a few questions coming through. Um, I'll just start back at the top. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. How can a, a word, how can you word a contract to ensure working over 38 hours a week is okay? We often get this question from our clients and as I said re the client last week that said um, their ordinary hours of work were 43, the way in which you can word that is to say that your ordinary hours of work are 38 and that you will be regularly required or rostered to work an additional, let's say, five hours per week and that the additional hours, your salary has been adjusted to include the additional payment for the additional five hours per week. It's really important to do the better off overall test to ensure that the rate of pay, be it a salary, or an hourly rate has been adjusted to include the overtime that is applicable to that additional five hours per week. If, it, if the person that's asked that question needs some assistance with that, that's exactly the sort of assistance that we provide our clients, so happy to help. Okay, that's great. Um, another question is, can you clarify long service leave in the building industry? Based in WA, are you required to pay long service leave to a separate body and is that for all employees or are supervisors long service leave allowed to remain on a normal payroll system and paid through you directly? Mm. Charlotte, unfortunately that's far too specific a question for this, um, this quorum or this environment. Um, so I can't answer that question right here and now, but I can certainly have a conversation offline um, with the person that's asked that question because that's very, the superannuation um, acts in the building industry are very specific to the states um, and depend very much on the type of building that is being undertaken by that particular employer and whether it's commercial work or whether it's domestic work. So happy to have that conversation offline. Okay, not a problem. Um, we are in the construction industry. If an employee resigns, are we required to pay out any unused personal leave? Um, that will depend on whether or not there is an enterprise agreement in place and the provisions within that enterprise agreement. Under the award, um, personal leave is not paid out but annual leave is. Okay. Um, our full-time employees do not have the rate as at the last day in the pay period showing on their payslip. We use the Reckon payslip modified to our organisation. Can, oh, yeah, I don't know if that's just, if you can understand that. So um, what I got from that was that we use the Reckon modified payslip and the employees don't have the rate of pay on their payslip. Was that what I heard? You do not have the rate as at the last day in the pay period showing on the payslip. Right. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, I think that might be a bit confusing. I'll uh, just move on to the next question. Um, can a staff member be paid a base rate which is above the award rate and therefore no leave loading paid? Yes, they can. Um, but the documentation needs to say that annual leave loading is included within the rate of pay 
and you need to assess against the applicable award whether the base rate of pay and the annual leave loading meets the rate of pay that you are paying. So you, they, the employee can't be disadvantaged. Okay. Um, where can people find the domestic violence definition in writing, would you suggest? I wouldn't suggest you go there yet um, because it actually hasn't come through the Commission yet. It's going to a full bench hearing on the 2nd and 3rd of May and in the event that it does go through, there will be lots of publicity about, about this particular provision under the Fair Work Act and we will provide that to our clients at that time. So I wouldn't go there just yet. Um, what needs to be done for bullying training? So employees and managers need to understand what is bullying and what isn't bullying. Um, managers and supervisors need to understand what their obligations are in terms of bullying in the event that bullying is reported to them. We often hear um, in, in businesses where a manager will say, oh, that's not bullying, just grow up, you just need to get a bit tougher um, and it's dismissed rather than it being taken seriously and the appropriate process being put in place to undertake, um, not a, I'm not talking about a full-blown investigation but at least a, an inquiry about whether the behaviour in the workplace that the employee is claiming is bullying is appropriate or inappropriate and is or isn't bullying. Some bullying is very, very low level but it can still be deemed to be bullying. So employees and managers need to understand what is bullying and what isn't bullying. Under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the National Act and the State-Based Act, there is a common definition of bullying. There's also a common definition of performance management and performance management undertaken by a reasonable person in a reasonable manner is not bullying, but performance management taken unreasonably can be deemed to be bullying. So it's really important that managers understand where that line is. I'm not sure if I answered that question, Charlotte, um, but there is a requirement to do training to ensure that all employees, be they managers or, or other employees, understand um, their obligations to each other in the workplace. Okay, great. There's been a few questions coming through around bullying and harassment, so hopefully that helped a few people. Um, another question is, how do you class hours that you are on call? In this case, is it answering telephone calls outside the 38 hours per week, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. weekdays and 7 to 12 weekends? The phone doesn't always ring but must always be available to answer the call. Mm. That's, a, that's a, a specific question depending upon the award um, and I'm going to give, you a, give, give an example here. Under the real estate award, um, property managers are often required to be on call. The real estate award um, specifically says that property managers are entitled to an on-call allowance and that that, that that allowance must be agreed between the employer and the employee, so it doesn't state a specific amount, um, just that it may be agreed, must be agreed. Um, so that's an example of how that works. Um, being on call, for example, under the manufacturing or under the um, yeah, Manufacturing and Associated Industries Award, there is a specific allowance in that particular award. So it depends on the circumstances, but again, happy to have that question offline to get more detail um, to understand the specific requirements of where the question is coming from. Okay, that's great. Um, is there a requirement for annual leave, personal leave and RDOs to be shown on payslips? No. But in the event that an employee requests their annual leave, personal leave and RDO balance, you must provide that to them. But there is no legal requirement to have leave on pay slips at this point. And I don't see that changing in the short term. 
Okay, thanks. Um, this person uses the default reckon pay slip, which does not include a field for the salary rate as at the date of payment. Is this then not in compliance with the legal requirements? Um, I would never say that reckons pay slips is not in compliance with the legal requirements, but maybe that's something that we need to have a look at with reckon. Okay, thanks. Um, Sorry, there's just quite a few to go through. What should be included in an employee handbook? Hmm, that's a great question. An employee handbook includes all, all the policies that are specific to your particular business. For example, if you have a so normally it would have a bit of a mission statement at the front of it and then it would have things like your leave policy, your requirements around applying for annual leave, your requirements around taking personal leave, um, your social media policy, your harassment and bullying policy, your discrimination policy, your um, travel policy, your reimbursement of expenses policy your workplace health and safety policies, so all of the policies that are pertinent to your business and most of that would be the same from business to business but there may be requirements, <coughs> excuse me, from time to time to have specific um, policies that are only related to your business and I'll give you a great example of that. We have a client that is a dog toy manufacturer and part of, their, um, part of their employee benefit is that their employees are actually allowed to bring their dogs to work. But they needed an employee bringing your dog to work policy. So we actually worked with them to research that and to write one for them because whilst that might sound lovely, it also provides complications in the workplace. If the dog's sick, you know, do employees get extra breaks to take their dogs out for a walk? Um, how is all that stuff going to work? So we wrote that policy for them and that's specific to their business and it's in their employee handbook. So all of those policies that that are required within your business need to be in your employee handbook. Okay. Um, is there a maximum number of hours you can employ someone on a casual basis? Do you need to provide all casual employees with a letter of offer? That's two questions and I'll answer the second one first. Yes, you are required to pay a, a, to, to provide a casual with a letter of offer. And the letter of offer states the award that they are respondent to, their rate of pay. Their rate of pay is either inclusive of or has on top of it their 25% casual loading and the notice period um, because under most awards the notice period for a casual is one hour and if the employer wants to enforce that then it needs to go in the letter. Um, <clears throat> the second question or the first question was does a casual work a, num a maximum number of hours per week? Um, again, that is dependent upon the award and the industry that we're talking about and I'm going to go very general here. Generally speaking, the maximum hours of work for any employee is 38 and once you get to 38, overtime applies. So employees can work more hours, it's just that you have to pay overtime beyond 38 hours. Okay, sure. Um, if no, if if not mentioned in the letter of offer that employees are entitled to seventeen point five percent annual loading leave loading. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Are you saying that if not mentioned in the letter of offer that employees are entitled to seventeen point five annual leave loading? Absolutely. And there's been a number of cases that have gone into the Fair Work Commission about exactly that, that 
<clears throat> even if you pay an employee $100,000 a year and you don't state in their letter of offer that that includes their annual leave loading, then they are entitled to annual leave loading on top of that. Okay, is leave loading applicable in all cases irrespective of award and if not being specifically addressed by any EA or contract? No, you need to check the award and or enterprise agreement. And if the contract is silent, then you go back to the award or the enterprise agreement, whichever is applicable. Um, we've now reached 12 o'clock, Cheryl, did you want to continue with some questions or...? No, I think we might call it a day. Okay. Um, what do you think, Charlotte? Yeah, that yeah, sounds, that sounds got, about right. I've just got um, two more very quick things um, to... Hmm, and my, my computer has frozen. Here we go. Um, HR Advice Online provides services to small to medium businesses all around Australia. So we have a um, we have a website where you can access templates, for example, letters of offer, um, forms, checklists, policies, employee handbook. They're all there and they're written for you. We have a HR advisory team that provides assistance with specific questions for employers and we provide updates on changes to the legislation when they occur. You can pay by the month or you can do an annual subscription and it's a minimum of 12 months. This is how to contact us. If you like the presentation from today, please send us an email and um, we will send the presentation to you. Thanks for being on the call everyone, really appreciate the questions and the numbers on the call. Um, it was great to have you all here. Thanks Charlotte. Thank you everyone for participating and see you at the next session. Thanks.